All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of TED Talk Stamps. As I promised a couple of videos back, I'm having a program on crash covers, airline crash covers or aircraft crash covers. And I've got with me as my guest today, the foremost expert on crash covers, Ken Sanford. And I'll let him introduce himself and explain himself to you, <laughs> Ken. Okay, so I'm Ken Sanford. I've been collecting air crash covers for maybe 30 or 40 years. Um, I'm a member of the American Air Mill Society. I was past president back in the 80s. Um, and I'm now the editor of the Journal of the Wreck and Crash Mail Society, um, which we have about 80 members worldwide who collect air crash covers, um, shipwreck, train wreck, uh, terrorism and various things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just get into what is an air crash cover. And there have been conflicting definitions written by different people over the years. Uh, some aircraft have mishaps which result in delay or damage to the aircraft, and some of uh, which uh, cannot really be considered a crash. Uh, the mail they're carrying is undamaged. Um, other aircraft have crashes, bad landings, fires, etc where the mail may be damaged, but sometimes it isn't. And such mail sometimes receives special markings by postal authorities, and sometimes it doesn't. So for the purposes of this um, talk, I've decided to closely follow the definition uh, by the American Airmail Society, um, which they came out with a few years ago. And it's broken down into two slightly different situations. So a crash is in incomplete flight due to the aircraft um, having an accident resulting in damage to or destruction of the aircraft with the mails, if not lost or destroyed, forwarded by other aircraft or other means, sometimes refer referred to as recovered mail or salvage mail. And then there's an interrupted flight and that's a flight which is interrupted or delayed en route resulting in an unscheduled or forced landing usually due to adverse weather or an aircraft mechanical problem. Uh, the flight usually continued later by the same aircraft or to expedite mail by another aircraft. So collectible mail from crashes or interrupted flights is that which is capable of identification by postmarks and routing, physical damage, special caches, labels, or other official memoranda. Um, there's one, now one primary reference for crash covers, which is uh, Air Crash Mail of the World. Um, I was the editor, and it was published by the American Airmail Society in April of this year. Uh, it incorporated the two major references for air crash mail. Um, the first one was Recovered Mail by Henry Nearink, which was published in 1993 and 1995. And the Interrupted Flight section of the American Airmail Catalog volume, uh, the sixth edition, volume one. Um, Nearing covered the whole world except for the U.S. and Canada, and the American Airmail catalog covered U.S. and Canada. So most collectors of crash covers specialize in a particular area, such as U.S., Europe, Africa, Asia, or South America. Some collectors cover one country or a specific airline such as Pan American World Airways, TWA, American Airlines, et cetera. I actually specialize in two airlines, Pan American Airways and Imperial Airways of Great Britain, which was the international airline of Great Britain from 1924 to 1940. Um, there's a specialized society, which I mentioned, the Wreck and Crash Mail Society. Um, we cover all aspects of crash and wreck mail air crash covers, train wreck covers, shipwreck covers, covers from natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods, volcanic eruption, eruptions, avalanches, as well as terrorism, uh, aircraft hijackings, wars, mail robberies, etc. cetera. Um, so we have the quarterly journal called La Catastrophe, which in French means uh, the uh, catastrophe. Um, the original editor lived in New Orleans, so that's why he named it that, that way. Um, 
the earliest crash covers were actually um, during the siege of Paris in 1870 and 1871. Yeah, this is a, um, a cover from the balloon called the Ville d'Orléans um, that got caught in a, in a storm during the night and ended up in Norway. Um, they um, were over the coast and they realized that they were coming down fast. So they threw out a couple of mailbags hmm. into the water. So when you throw out that much weight, the balloon goes back up and then it went over land and they were coming down again. So the two aeronauts, as the pilots were called, jumped out of the basket and they weren't injured. The balloon went on for a few more miles and finally crash landed. And so this is a cover from that um, incident. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the next uh, major incident was actually um, the US government airmail service between Washington and New York um, in May, 1918. And some of these uh, flights crashed. So uh, the second cover is from the first flight from Washington to New York on that first day, May 15th. The pilot got lost crash landed in a field near Waldorf, Maryland. He wasn't injured and the mail wasn't really damaged. Yeah, usually when mail is recovered from a crash, it, it is damaged. And the post office processing the mail applies a cachet explaining the damage. Um, and the, um, the next slide shows a number of different varieties of cachets. Um, the uh, post office is used to um, before around 1946, 47, the cachets were rather explanatory. Sometimes they even mentioned the name of the airline or the name of the aircraft. Um, and, um, and then you can also have uh, a label that's prepared by a post office instead of a cachet, or you can have uh, a mimeograph explanation for the mimeograph explanation for the uh, cup damaged. Some people, as I mentioned, collect by airline. So the next one is a cover from the one of the earliest airline crashes. This was a British airline called Air Transport and Travel. And that crashed near Eltham, Great Britain on the 22nd of August, 1920. That's one of my earliest. Um, and it was a predecessor of Imperial Airways. Uh, the next one was a crash from uh, Varney Airlines which was one of the early contract airmail uh, service operators and crashed in Jordan Valley, Oregon on April 6, 1926. And Varney was a predecessor of United Airlines. Uh, the next one was a United Airlines DC-3 that crashed in the ocean just off of Point Reyes, California in November, 1938. And um, I have a photograph taken from another aircraft showing the, the fuselage which washed up onto the beach. Uh, there's quite a lot of mail recovered from this. It's fairly common. Does a, does a lot of this mail get into the collector community? Uh, oh, yeah. Community? Because when, when people receive a crash cover with a marking on it or a label or, or post office mimeo, uh, they usually save it because it's something unusual. So it ends up in, collect, in the hands of a dealer or another collector. That's how we get these. People I don't see. throw it away because it's just something unusual. Right, right. So the next one was a uh, American Airlines crash in Goodwin, Arkansas, January 1936. And um, that received a fairly uh, descriptive cachet. The next one was uh, August 15th, 1928. Pan American Airways uh, was operating a flight from Havana, Cuba to Key West, Florida. And the, the pilot encountered conditions with poor visibility. He got lost and he ditched the aircraft in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of St. Petersburg, Florida. The passengers and the pilot were rescued by a nearby boat and the water soaked mail was recovered and was dried out in the ovens of a bakery. How convenient. Um, <laughs> yeah. And as I mentioned, some people collect by continent, South America, for example. So um, I show a cover from Scada, which was an airline in Colombia, which crashed in May, on May 16, 1929. And it got a rather descriptive cachet by a post office in Colombia. 
and these are pretty rare. There's only a few of these known. Uh, the, it actually got a label applied by the uh, Bogota post office. Other people collect covers connected with Africa and you can have a wide variety because of so many different countries and so many different airlines that operated there. This one was a crash of Imperial Airways, a flying boat by the name of the Corsair. Um, it got lost and crashed into a small river in the Belgian Congo, uh, the eastern edge of the Belgian Congo. The hull was torn open by a submerged rock and repairs took a long time. They took about six months. The aircraft finally flew out after about six months. And there's a few covers from this. They're not, not too many. I have a cover from the Corsair crash uh, from South Africa to Paris and the French post office uh, applied a cachet which explained the damage to the cover. Um, and covers from this crash are fairly scarce. There's not too much mail was recovered. Some people collect crashes by aircraft type. For example, I have a cover from the um, Pan American Sikorsky S-40 American Clipper, and that was not really a crash, but it damaged its pontoons at Barranquilla, Colombia on uh, November 25th, 1931. It was on the first scheduled flight by that aircraft. So the pilots were Charles Lindbergh and Basil Rowe, who, who was an early Pan Am pilot, and Igor Sikorsky was a passenger on the flight, and my cover is autographed by all three of them. Hmm. Another um, aircraft type, which there were a lot of crashes, and those were the British <clears throat> short flying boats. So the next cover was from the uh, boat flying boat called the Calpuria, and that crashed on a lake um, in Iraq. And that mail was going from primarily from... Um, England to Australia. So that's what my cover is, is to Australia. Um, a lot of mail was recovered from that. There's a lot of um, mail known from that. Another area or another type of aircraft, which uh, you can find quite a number of crash covers from, and that's the Boeing 707. And this next one was with BOAC, which crashed on takeoff from London in April, 1968. Um, it was going to Tel Aviv, Israel, so it has a Hebrew cachet applied by the Tel Aviv post office. The next one um, in my collection is from Imperial Airways, which is operating the Lockheed Electra, and this was on a flight from London to Basel, Switzerland. It crashed in France, caught fire, and um, all the passengers and the crew were able to get out of the aircraft. And there's quite a bit of mail from this, all addressed to Switzerland, different cities in Switzerland. So I have covers from to Geneva with a two-line red cachet. I have covers to Basel, Zurich, and various places. And there's about four or five different cachets from this. Some people collect crashes from balloon flights. Most balloon crashes are souvenir covers and not official mail, but they're still collectible. The next cover was from a balloon that was participating in the Gordon Bennett balloon race, which crashed near Palm Springs, California in May, 1985. The original Gordon Bennett races were all in Europe. And then some of them later on were in the US. Uh, another area where you can find crash covers is from military air crashes. And so my next cover is from a Army Emergency Air Mail Service uh, in 1934. This crashed in Greenville, South Carolina on February 19th, um, what happened is the post office canceled all the mail contracts because they thought there was um, fraud going on and they had the army carrying the mail for a month or two. And it was in winter time, the pilots were relatively inexperienced, a lot of bad weather with snow. Uh, so there were three or four crashes during that period. In this one, the pilot survived and he autographed some covers after the crash. So my cover has his autograph on it. Mm -hmm. Another cover was from a military a flight which crashed somewhere in the Pacific Ocean in November 1944. Um, there were a few crashes in the Pacific during the war. I can imagine. <laughs> and, yeah, mail is known from some of them. It's sometimes difficult to get details of the military crashes because it was wartime and the details weren't. They were either secret or they didn't have the time to record anything. Uh, so sometimes you see these covers, you don't really know what crash it's from. 
Another way that some people collect crash covers is uh, finding them with a particular stamp. So for example, some people collect covers with the US Airmail Beacon stamp, Scott C-11. So the next cover was from a crash with a Beacon stamp. That was the crash of Western Air Express in Alhambra, California on December 22nd, 1930. This is fairly common. You see covers from this on eBay every week. Hmm. Of um, that particular recce? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, some covers, collectors try to find covers with the five cent wing globe airmail stamp, which was commonly used stamp during that period, 1930s. That was Scott C-16. So my next cover is from a Pacific Air Transport <coughs> crash in Burbank, California on May 16, 1932. Um, Pacific Air Transport was a predecessor of United Airlines. And on that one, the Burbank Post Office applied a four-line black cache. Some people uh, collect covers from one country, India, for example. So um, my next cover was from Imperial Airways uh, flying boat, Centurion, which crashed on landing in Calcutta on June 12, 1939. The passengers and the crew were managed to get out and they were rescued by a boat. And I have a, a really neat photograph which shows them standing on the fuselage of the aircraft just before they were rescued and then the boat sank, the flying boat sank. Uh, the Calcutta Post Office processed a lot of mail and they used what we call a John Bull rubber stamp kit where the individual letters are inserted. So there's many variations such as the spilling Centuria instead of Centurion, uh, missing letters, inverted letters, all, all sorts of varieties. Uh, we list about um, 30 or 40 different varieties in the air crash mail of the world. Hmm. And most of that mail was from Australia to England, some, some of it from Hong Kong and China, but majority from Australia. Well, the... Um different varieties of those hand stamps do they command higher or lower values yeah some of, them, yeah some of them do for instance the misspelling centuria that's worth a bit more than the normal centurion uh -huh. yeah um another one in my collection is from the pan am a boeing 314 uh, flying boat called the yankee clipper and that crashed on landing in lisbon portugal on 22nd of February, 1943. It was carrying a lot of mail, that something like 90 bags of mail. Huh. Um, so um, I have covers to many European countries. Um, this is probably one of the scarcest, a cover to Portugal with a cachet, uh, which reads Salvados to Yankee Clipper. And I have covers in my collection to England, which is the most common to France, Switzerland, Germany, Sweden, a lot of different countries. So then I suppose uh, in that case, people might collect various covers from that same crash then, uh, to, oh, oh, to yeah, get right. uh, different country you, destinations. Oh, yeah. You could put together one or two frames of mail just from that crash. Huh. And, and that was a famous uh, crash because uh, there were people, uh, entertainers that were going for the um, to entertain the troops in Europe, and there was a, a singer called Jane Froman, uh, who was well known, and she was in that crash. She was injured, and when she was in the hospital, she met uh, one of the co-pilots, and they later got married. Hmm. That was a whole interesting story in itself. Some people collect crash mail from transoceanic record flights. For example, in uh, starting in 1919, um, there were flights from Newfoundland to uh, England and Ireland. And I show a cover from uh, the famous flight from the pilots Alcock and Brown. In June 1919, they made a flight from Newfoundland and they crashed in a bog in Ireland. And uh, they were carrying souvenir covers. And those are pretty scarce because they were only carrying a handful of covers. Um, some people try to find covers that were autographed by pilots after the flight, uh, the crash. 
So I have a couple of them. Um, in my collection is one from the Imperial Airways crash of the Artemis and crashed in Petersburg, South Africa in uh, February, 1936. Um, on takeoff, the aircraft crashed into trees at the end of the runway. The pilot survived and he autographed some of the covers that were recovered. And those are pretty scarce. There's less than 10 covers uh, recorded huh. from that. Another one, um, it's, um, it was an air race in 1936 from England to South Africa called the Schlesinger Air Race. And one of the pilots, um, Clauston, crashed in Felixburg, Southern Rhodesia, and he was carrying souvenir covers and he autographed them after the crash. Another interesting um, area for crash covers is aircraft that have been shot down or had bombs on them. Yeah, now that's interesting. <laughs> Bullet holes in them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I have a I show a cover. It's not in my collection. That was an Imperial Airways uh, flight that was going from Hong Kong to Bangkok in 1939, and it was flying over a Japanese-held island, and um, Japanese fighters. Uh, shot it and forced it to land on the island. And this is a cover from that flight, which has bullet holes in it. Um, and that, that's uh, in the um, Australian National Museum in, um, in Canberra. And that had 90 bullet holes in, in the aircraft, but they were still able to land. Hmm. And they were able to patch it up. And, and the, a few days later, they let them uh, take off and go back to Hong Kong. Um, covers from that crash are pretty scarce, pretty rare. Um, the most famous one with a bomb on it was uh, Pan Am Flight 103, which was operating from London to New York uh, in December 1988, when a bomb exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. And it was carrying uh, mail from U.S. military personnel in Germany. And uh, so this is a cover from my, one of my for my collection um, and that got a label applied by the military post office in New York, uh, applied to the back of the covers, which explains what it's from. And there's less than 10 covers um, recorded from that. And an interesting thing with that, it was already up into the jet stream. So um, when it exploded, the jet stream carried the mailbags about 60 miles to the east. And that mailbags landed intact, so the the covers are not really damaged. Um, another area with covers is uh, crashes or incidents involving terrorism. And there was a British Airways Vicar VC-10, which was hijacked by by Muslim terrorists at Dubai in November 1974. So I show a cover from that incident. Um, most of the mail on that was um, from the UK to Australia. And also there are not many of those known. Those are pretty scarce. There are a number of famous crashes from which covers are known. And probably the most famous was the German airship Hindenburg, which crashed in Lake Hurst, New Jersey in May 1937. Um, I show a postcard recovered from that crash. There were nearly 300 pieces of mail recovered, but uh, because it's so famous, uh, they go for a lot of money. They go for eight to ten thousand dollars when they come up in auction. So, of course, uh, counterfeiters have stepped in in that area. Yes, there, yes, there are a few counterfeit uh, Hindenburg covers around, and usually the way you can tell them is um, th they show singeing across the center of the cover which would not be normal because the covers were in bundles. So normally the singeing would only be around the edges. Or in one of the counterfeit uh, Hindenburg covers, the counterfeiters placed a um, post office ceiling label in the middle of the cover. And that would never be applied in the middle of the cover. It would only be on the edges to keep the contents from falling out. So that was one of the counterfeits which I show um, in um, as part of my uh, talk. Some covers we can't identify as to what crash they're in, uh, usually during wartime. 
when the records weren't kept or were, there's not a clear postmark. Um, for instance, if, the, if it w landed in water and the stamps are missing, then you don't have a postmark quite often. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a problem sometimes and be able to identify what crash a cover is from. Um, and I show a, a US Army um, cover, which um, isn't recorded and we can't identify what it's from. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there used to be three catalogs used to um, identify crash covers. That was the Nearing catalog and the American Air Mile catalog. And there was another one um, originally um, published in England. It was called the History of Wreck Covers. Uh, but those were all replaced by our air crash mail of the world in April this year. I worked on that for quite a few years. And um, what it is, we didn't publish a book because it's 2,200 pages in it. And it would have been too big as a book. So we published it on a credit card size flash drive, which can be plugged into a USB port of a computer. And um, we sh show 1,600 illustrations of covers, caches, labels, all in full color where we, where we had them in full color. Mm -hmm. And it's available on there in either Word or PDF format. So it, it lists and describes all crashes from which covers have been recorded. And um, people ask, well, where can you get crash covers? So there's a number of sources such as auction houses, stamp dealers, eBay, which has quite a lot or you trade with other collectors. That's where I've gotten a lot of my crash covers. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of societies which have articles about crash covers and have collectors of crash covers. And primarily there are the American Airmail Society, the Australian Airmail Society, the Canadian Aerophilatelic Society, and the Airmail Society of New Zealand. And we have a, a New York area society called the Metropolitan Airport Society. So as I mentioned, we have the Wreck and Crash Mail Society. And if anybody is interested in that, they can email me. My email address is k-a-e-r-o-p-h-i-l at gmail.com. So I have a lot of fun collecting crash covers and um, it's um, it's been quite interesting. Yeah, it sounds interesting. I don't know if you have any questions, um, any further questions, Ted? Uh um, have any. Uh, watch the comments section, though, for questions from the viewers in the coming days. So, uh, okay. All Good. right. Well, that was great, Ken. I appreciate that. That was a uh, real interesting. And like I said, if any of the viewers out there have questions for Ken, just leave them in the comments below, and I promise he'll get to you. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thanks, Ken. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Okay. And this is Ted, the Talking Stamp Collector, wishing you all happy stamping. All right. And happy holidays. Oh, and happy holidays. <laughs>